All right, we are now on section 10.3, phase transitions. Here we're going to define phase transitions and phase transition temperatures, explain the relation between phase transition temperatures and intermolecular attractive forces, and describe the processes represented by typical heating and cooling curves and compute heat flows and enthalpy changes accompanying these processes. So there's three types of phase transitions we're gonna talk about. Vaporization and condensation, melting and freezing, and sublimation and deposition. So let's start with vaporization. This occurs when a liquid is converted into a gas or vapor. If you have an open container, this is going to continue to happen until all the liquid converts to a vapor. So evaporation, right? Vapor evaporation. If you have a cup of water and you leave it out long enough, eventually the water's gone. Or let's say you wash a cup of water, you dry it, but there's still some water inside. You leave it out to dry, eventually all that water will vaporize. However, if your container is closed, the process of vaporization is countered by condensation. So what's happening is you constantly have this, your liquid becoming a vapor and that vapor becoming a gas in what is called a dynamic equilibrium. So that's what this double arrow indicates. It's still happening, but it's an equilibrium, so it doesn't look like there's any change going on. So the rate at which the liquid is becoming a vapor is the same as the rate at which the vapor is becoming a liquid. I told this to do a double arrow, but... Okay, so again, when the rates are the same, we establish a dynamic equilibrium. The liquid level in your closed container will not change after we've established equilibrium. For example, bromine liquid and vapor in equilibrium. So you've got some bromine liquid that's in a closed container, and if you were to look in that container, you would also see um, some red vapor above it. Bromine is kind of a red color. So if we have a bottle here that's closed, okay, and we've got our red bromine liquid, up here we would also have some bromine vapor, but the liquid level isn't changing because we have a dynamic equilibrium going on where the liquid is becoming a vapor and the vapor is becoming a liquid at the same rates. Okay. So after we've reached equilibrium, the number of molecules in the gas phase does not change with time. So the pressure exerted by the vapor over the liquid remains constant. Remember, pressure is the number of collisions with the wall of a container. So you can consider that where the liquid and gas um, interface is, that liquid is considered a wall of your container in a way. So the pressure that's being exerted on the liquid by the gas stays constant at equilibrium. So this pressure of a vapor in equilibrium with a liquid is called its vapor pressure. So here's kind of a picture showing what's going on. You have some liquid and you're allowing the molecules to escape the liquid surface to form a vapor. And this is going to keep happening until eventually we reach equilibrium and we get this vapor pressure by the difference in our mercury or whatever's height. So there's a manometer again, or manometer. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, to be completely honest. Now the vapor pressure of a substance is independent of the volume of the container. Okay, so that doesn't actually matter for the vapor pressure. Now, the area of the surface of the liquid that's in contact, again, has no effect on the vapor pressure, but it will affect the time required to establish equilibrium. Now, what the vapor pressure does depend on are the intermolecular forces of the substance. If you have strong intermolecular forces, you're gonna have a lower vapor pressure because it's harder to vaporize the liquids. If you have a low intermolecular forces, you're going to have a higher vapor pressure because the gas, there's easier gas capture. So it's easy, it has an easier time to go into the gas phase, and so then you're going to have more gas molecules. So in terms of intermolecular forces, here's an example. We want to use these structural formulas and explain their relative vapor pressures in terms of their types and extents of intermolecular forces. 
So looking at these, the first thing we should notice is that ethanol, ethylene glycol, and water all have OHs, meaning that they are going to have hydrogen bonds occurring in them. So diethyl ether then doesn't have hydrogen bonds. It does have a small dipole with this oxygen in the middle here. But because of that, it's going to have the weakest intermolecular forces, meaning it has the highest vapor pressure. Now, ethanol is small, okay, so smaller means less uh, intermolecular forces, but it can form hydrogen bonds. Water is a lot smaller, but it forms very, very strong hydrogen bonds, so it's going to still have higher, stronger intermolecular attractions than the ethanol. So ethanol, then, is going to be our second highest, okay, it's small. It's got a little bit more nonpolarness with these carbon groups on them, which also explains why the water has a lower vapor pressure, more intermolecular forces. But then ethylene glycol over here has two OH groups on it. So it's going to have the lowest vapor pressure because it has the most intermolecular forces. It can do a lot more hydrogen bonding. It's also a lot larger than water. Now the vapor pressure of a liquid is going to increase with increasing temperature. And this makes sense, right? Because we're raising the kinetic energy of the molecules. Think gas laws too. Temperature and pressure are directly proportional to each other. So we raise the temperature of the liquid, more molecules are now going to have enough kinetic energy to escape from the liquid phase and go into the gas phase. For example, water um, at 24 millimeters of mercury, it, or sorry, at 25 degrees Celsius, it has a vapor pressure of 24 millimeters of mercury. But at 50 degrees Celsius, that pressure jumps all the way up to 92 millimeters of mercury for its vapor pressure. And then here's also just a kind of relative graph showing you, okay, this, this dashed line is the minimum kinetic energy needed for the liquid to escape as a gas. So as we increase the temperature, notice we've shifted this, equal, this um, graph over to the right to higher kinetic energy, and now we, can, we also have more molecules that can escape. Okay, so if we look at the area under the curves, that's the total amount of molecules. So this here in red is at the lower temperature, but in green, and kind of these green bars, is this whole thing for um, the higher temperature. So a lot more molecules can now become gases. Now, when the vapor pressure of a liquid is high enough to equal the external atmospheric pressure, the liquid reaches its boiling point. So the temperature at which a liquid boils depends on the pressure above it. Okay, so if you're trying to boil some water on the stove, what's happening is you're increasing the kinetic energy of those water molecules until they're able to form gases, and then you get to a point where that vapor pressure that you've created is the same as the environment, and now the water starts to boil. The normal boiling point, this is a term of a liquid, is the temperature at which the liquid boils when the pressure above the liquid is one atmosphere. Okay, so, and then during the boiling process, the temperature remains constant. So just like when vaporization is happening, the temperature doesn't change. Same with condensation. And when it's condensing, temperature doesn't change. But yeah, when we boil, the temperature remains constant. Now variations in atmospheric pressure are going to change our boiling point. When you go to a higher altitude, the atmospheric pressure is lower, and this is because there's less gas molecules in, around you. So you have less gas molecules hitting you, meaning lower pressure. So this is why there's, some box, there's pasta boxes and whatnot that say you have to boil 
your pasta for longer times or cook for longer times at higher altitude because the boiling point of water is lower. Okay, this somewhat applies to us here in the high desert. Um, we're not super high enough where it's going to affect too terribly much, but there might be a slight effect. You might notice if you were boiling water and you check the temperature that it's not 100 degrees Celsius. It might actually be a little bit lower. And then here's uh, some graphs, a graph showing you different uh, compounds, different liquids, uh, and their boiling points at different pressures. And then the gray line, the horizontal gray line is one atmosphere or 101.3 kilopascals. And then it is also just showing you where your, the graphs um, correspond with it. And so you can see water at one ATM, 100 degrees Celsius. We're a little bit lower than one ATM. I would, I'm just going to kind of take a guess here and say, hey, maybe we're about here on the graph. So water may boil more at like, 98 degrees Celsius. Not a big difference, but close, but not quite 100. Now, one way that we can relate a substance's vapor pressure and its temperature is by using the clausius clapeyron equation. Okay, and this tells us that the pressure is equal to A, E, yes, that mathematical E, to the negative delta H vaporization divided by RT. So A is a constant that is dependent on the identity of the substance. Delta H vaporization is the enthalpy of vaporization in joules. T is temperature in Kelvin. And R is a universal gas constant. And we need to use 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, this is still a universal gas constant. It has different numbers that are depending on the units being need that are needed. So if we take the natural log of both sides of this, because just, you know, exponentials and exponents are annoying. What ends up happening is we form a linear relationship. We take, make the natural log of pressure is equal to negative delta H VAP over RT plus the natural log of A. So if you were to be in a lab, for instance, you would measure pressure and temperature. Okay, and so that's what you would graph then would be the natural log of pressure on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, you would graph 1 over t. And your slope is equal to negative delta H vaporization divided by R. So then you could actually calculate delta H vaporization. Your y-intercept is equal to the natural log of A. Right about that part. So you're, you would get your y-intercept from this, the equation of your graph. And then you know what r is. And then you could actually solve for delta H vaporization. So now let's say you take two points in the line. You get these two equations. Natural log of P1 and natural log of P2. And natural log of A is a constant. Okay, so we can solve for it and then set these two equations equal to each other. And we wind up with the equation that we more often use, this form of the clausius clapeyron equation. The natural log of P2 divided by P1 is equal to delta H vaporization over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. So you can actually uh, be able to look at, at what changing the pressures and temperatures, um, how they affect the system. So let's look at an example. Isooctane has an octane rating of 100. It is used as one of the standards for the octane rating system for gasoline. At 34 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure is 10.0 kilopascals, and at 98.8, it's 100.0 kilopascals. Use this information to estimate the enthalpy of vaporization for isooctane. So let's start by writing our equation. We know that the natural log of P2 over P1 is equal to delta H VAP over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. And let's write down what we know. Our T1 
is equal to 34 degrees, 34.0 degrees Celsius. We need to add to 73.15. So this is 307.2 Kelvin. Our P1 is equal to 10.0 kilopascals. We actually don't need to worry about um, the units of pressure here because the units are going to cancel out when we take the natural logs. And, the, and even if we were to convert them, we get the same ratio. Our T2 is 98.8 degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So this is 372 Kelvin, and our P2 is equal to 100 kilopascals. So we're solving for delta H VAP here. So let's go ahead and um, isolate it. So we start by dividing both sides by 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. So the natural log of P2 over P1 divided by 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2 equals delta H VAP over R. And then multiply both sides by R to get it by itself. So we get R times the natural log of P2 over P1 divided by 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2 is equal to delta H VAP. So let's go ahead and plug and chug. So this is 8.314 joules per mole times Kelvin times our natural log of P2, 100 kPa divided by P1, 10.0 kPa. Notice kilopascals cancel out. Divide this by 1 over 307.2 Kelvin minus 1 over 372.0 Kelvin. And this then comes out to be 33,800 joules per mole. And if we want to put this in terms of kilojoules, we get 33.8 kilojoules per mole. All right, another example. This one we're going to estimate temperature. We're told benzene has a normal boiling point of 80.1 degrees Celsius, and its enthalpy of vaporization is 30.8 kilojoules per mole. We want to know the boiling point of benzene in Denver, where the atmospheric pressure is 83.4 kilopascals. So let's start by writing down what we know. We know our T1 is equal to 80.1 degrees Celsius. Let's turn that into Kelvin. So this is 353. 0.3 Kelvin. We know our, let's see, what else do we know? Oh, let's go ahead and write our enthalpy of vaporization down. We know delta H VAP is 30.8 kilojoules per mole. Okay, the normal boiling point, that means one ATM. Okay, and one ATM is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So we know our P1 is 101.3 kilopascals and our P2 is 83.4 kilopascals. So we need to solve for T2. So let's start with our equation. Natural log of P2 over P1 is equal to delta H VAP 
over r times 1 over t1 minus 1 over t2. Again, we're looking for t2 here. So first things first, let's multiply both sides by r over delta h of app. So now we get r times the natural log of p2 over p1 over delta h of app is equal to 1 over t1 minus 1 over t2. We're going to subtract 1 over t1 from both sides and then multiply everything times negative 1. So then that gives us 1 over t2 equals negative r times the natural log of p2 over p1 over delta h vap plus 1 over t1. And then the last thing we need to um, do one over this whole thing or put everything to the negative one power at the very end. So plugging and chugging these numbers, we get negative 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times the natural log of 83. 3.4 kilopascals divided by 101.3 kilopascals. Kilopascals cancel. This whole thing divided by delta H VAP, 30.8 kilojoules, which is, we're going to multiply this times 1,000, so it's 30,800 joules per mole. Whoops. times 1,000 joules per one kilojoule here just to have it down for us. Okay, plus 1 over T1, which is 353.3 Kelvin. And this whole thing is to the negative 1 power. So this, move this up here comes out to be, after you plug everything in, 346.9 Kelvin, or change that to Celsius, 73.8 degrees Celsius. So quite a change, about, what, seven-ish degrees, uh, degree difference in the boiling point. All right, so now let's talk about the enthalpy of vaporization. Vaporization is an endothermic process. So this is when a liquid turns into a gas. And you have personally felt this when you either get out of a pool or shower or bathtub and you start feeling cold because what's happening is the water on your skin is evaporating. So heat is being removed from your skin, causing you to feel cold. Now the reverse process is condensation. So gas condensing to a liquid and it's exothermic. Heat is released as that gas becomes a liquid. So you have a negative delta H VAP. And notice by the examples here for water that delta H condensation is equal to negative delta H vaporization because they are reverse, they're, they're opposite processes. So they are related by that negative sign. So for, let's look at an example. Uh, one way our body is cooled is by evaporation of the water in sweat. In very hot climates, we can lose as much as 1.5 liters of sweat per day. Although sweat is not pure water, we can get approximate value of the heat removed by evaporation by assuming that it is. So we're going to assume that sweat is pure water here. We want to uh, figure out how much heat is required to evaporate 1.5 liters of water or one and a half kilograms at a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. And we're given delta H VAP is 43.46 kilojoules per mole at 37 degrees. So we know our volume of sweat, this 1.5 liters. Okay. And we also know that there are 
or we can go ahead and say 1.5 kilograms since it told us that. And we know that we have 1,000 grams for every one kilogram. And notice our delta H VAP is kilojoules per mole. So we're going to have to turn these grams of water into moles. And that's why we went from kilograms to grams. So the molar mass of water is 18.02 grams per mole. So we know we have one mole of water per 18.02 grams of it. And then we know, based off of what they told us, that we have 43.46 kilojoules for every one mole of water. So this problem actually has turned into a nice conversion problem. And that's all we have to do. We get 3.6 times 10 to the third kilojoules, or 3,600 kilojoules of heat that are removed by one and a half kilograms or one and a half liters of water evaporating. It's kind of a lot of heat that you lose on a hot day if you sweat too much. Drink your water, kids. So there's someone sweating. All right, melting and freezing. So if you put enough energy into a solid to partially overcome the intermolecular forces, so there's still some at play, but they're not being held together in their fixed positions anymore. The solid is now transitioning to the liquid stage, and this is called melting. So when your solid starts melting, your temperature stops changing and stays constant until everything is melted. Okay, so this is the melting point. The temperature where we are starting to change phase from solid to liquid, and the temperature is constant while this happens, is our melting point. After everything is melted in liquid, then the temperature is gonna start rising again. Now let's say you get to the melting point, the temperature stops, and you are in a sealed container that is perfectly in insulated. You can turn the heat off because it's insulated, the, te the temperature is not gonna stay, it's not gonna um, change. So the phases are gonna stay in equilibrium. So you're gonna have solid and liquid present at the same time in a dynamic equilibrium like we talked about with gases and liquids. Now the reciprocal process of melting is freezing. And the freezing point of something is the same as its melting point. So for instance, water has a melting and freezing point of zero degrees Celsius. So if you have some water at zero degrees, you will have both solid and liquid present. So the enthalpy of fusion, and this, has, this is the enthalpy for melting, and your melting and freezing point depends on the strength of the attractive forces between your particles that are present. If you have weak intermolecular forces, you're gonna have lower melting point freezing points because you don't need as much energy to overcome them. If you have strong intermolecular forces, you're gonna have higher melting points or freezing points because you need more energy to overcome them. Now the amount of heat required to change one mole of a substance from the solid state to the liquid state is called the enthalpy of fusion or delta H fuse. Now, when you're melting, this is an endothermic process because heat has to go into your solid. But when freezing, heat is leaving, so it's exothermic. Okay, and they are opposites of each other, delta H fusion and delta H freezing. Notice opposite signs. Okay, but 6.01 times uh, kilojoules per mole, negative versus positive, depending on if you're melting or freezing. So this is an example. This, here's a beaker of ice that's initially at negative 12 degrees Celsius. That's all that's in it is ice. After 10 minutes, it's absorbed enough heat so that it's at zero degrees Celsius. And you can see a little bit of liquid in there. As the time has gone by, 30 minutes later, we're still at zero degrees Celsius, even though the ice has absorbed more heat because we still have solid and liquid present. My ice is still melting, but our temperature stays constant. Once all of it's melted, then that temperature is able to go up, in this case, to 22.2 degrees Celsius. 
So now we're going to talk about sublimation and, dep and deposition. So if a solid is able to go directly to the gaseous phase, so it doesn't become a liquid at all, this is called sublimation. So for example, dry ice, carbon dioxide at room temperature, goes from being a solid to a gas. It does not um, turn into a liquid. Freeze drying actually uses sublimation. And uh, next week I'll probably put a little video in uh, when we talk in my slides when we talk about it. Um, if you're at very high altitudes, snow actually um, transitions directly to water vapor. So this also happens there. Um, this needs a lot of energy put into it in order to overcome the intermolecular forces because you have to completely overcome them so you can, they can become a gas. So the enthalpy of sublimation is defined as the energy required to convert one mole of a substance from the solid to the gaseous phase. Its reverse process is deposition, where a gas condenses directly into the solid state. So frost is an example of this. So you've got water vapor, and it doesn't become a liquid first. It just goes directly to solid frost. Um, this is the opposite process of sublimation, so meaning it's going to have that negative sign versus um, sublimation for deposition. Now, it's not perfectly accurate, but... Um, we can use Hess's law to do a two-step model um, using enthalpy of melting and then vaporization to estimate enthalpy of sublimation. An example where you can see this is a solid iodine. So iodine is a solid at room temperature, but you can see this purple gas above it is it also sublimates at room temperature. Um, and then eventually it um, deposes as a solid all over the sides. Um, so here's using Hess's law to try to estimate the enthalpy of sublimation um, by using enthalpy of fusion and vaporization. You add them up to get sublimation. Also notice you actually need more energy to vaporize a liquid to a gas than you do for solid to liquid for fusion. All right, last part of this section, healing and cooling curves. And pay close attention to what I'm going to say, especially towards the end of this slide. So remember from thermochemistry, we talked about how Q equals MC delta T. Now this applies to heating or cooling matter, but not when a change of state is happening. Remember the ch temperature isn't changing. So if you try to use this, you're going to get Q equals zero because delta T is zero. The amount of heat needed to induce a phase change is we do Q equals N, where N is the number of moles of the matter you're looking at, and times delta H. So this could be delta H fusion, delta H vaporization, depends on whatever phase change you're looking at. So your, these enthalpies you need will either be found online or in the text, or I will give them to you on an exam. Again, N is moles of your substance. So maybe you're given grams, convert it to moles using molar mass. So if you want to know the total heat added or removed from a system that has phase changes, you have to do multiple types of energy calculations and then sum them all up. And we'll look at an example in a second. An example of this is heating ice on a stove. And ding, 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 extra credit opportunity. Take a good amount of ice, okay, and put it, in a pot on the stove and measure the temperature. And this is going to be time zero. So you're going to need to record your time and your temperature. Preferably do your temperature in degrees Celsius. Okay, if you measure it in Fahrenheit, convert it to Celsius, though Fahrenheit will technically work. So at time zero, you have your first temperature with just all ice. Okay, turn on the heat on the stove now, or whatever your heat source is, and measure the temperature every minute or so. Um, if it feels like it's taking a while, you can do five minutes, whatever. You could do like one minute, two minute, five minutes, whatever. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect intervals. And record the temperature at each of those times. So you need to make sure you have your time recorded as well. Okay, and you want to do this until everything, your water is fully boiling and you have a stable temperature at the boiling point. Okay, so make sure it's been stable for a couple minutes. 
and then you're going to plot this data. You want to have the t, your time, on the x-axis. Temperature on the y-axis. So you can plot this in Excel or hand do it on paper, graph paper, doesn't matter. Email it to me for 15 points of extra credit. What it should look like is something like this. So your ice should be below zero degrees Celsius at first. Okay, so as you're measuring your temperature with time, okay, you're, you should notice it's going up. Until you reach around zero degrees Celsius, you should see a small plateau in the temperature change. It may be very small because as you're adding more and more heat, it's going to melt quicker. Okay, but then you're going to have to start putting in more heat, so then it's going to start heating up again. Okay, so... Below that first plateau, the only thing present is solid. So this is all solid. And then at the plateau, you have solid and liquid. Because we are at the melting point. Slash freezing point. Okay. This is a heating curve, by the way. Now we've all melted at this point, And now we're going to start heating up again. So here we have all liquid present. So you're recording these temperatures as it's heating up, and then you should, and it starts to boil, and you should see a plateau. And this is where you have liquid plus gas. And this is where you can stop, because it's not easy to measure the temperature of water vapor, especially on just a stove. Okay, so stop when you have a little plateau. You, you notice that your temperature really hasn't changed as it's boiling. So this is what you're going to graph for me. Temperature on the y-axis, amount of heat added. We can't really do that. You're just going to do time. 15 points extra credit. So now let's look at a good example. How much heat is required to convert 135 grams of ice at negative... 15 degrees Celsius into water vapor at 120 degrees Celsius. This is a really good question. Um, I could see myself putting this on your final. This isn't going to be on your second midterm, but it is going to be on your final. So let's start that. So notice, though, we're going from negative 15 to 120. That means that we have phase changes. So we're, we have different steps. The first step is heating from negative 15 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. The second is melting. Okay, we're at zero degrees Celsius. The third stage is heating from zero degrees Celsius up to 100 degrees Celsius. And the fourth stage is boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. And then our last stage is heating from 100 degrees Celsius up to 120 degrees Celsius. So that means that we have five different hues that we have to calculate. And then the amount of heat is equal to the sum of them. So Q1. Q1, since this is regular heat, is MC delta T. So we have 135 grams times specific heat. If you recall, we're going to go ahead and do this in terms of joules. Sorry, I'm checking something right now. Ah, okay. So the specific heat of ice is not necessarily the same as the specific heat of water. So the specific heat of ice, sea ice, if you were to look that up, is 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius. So 2.09 grams, or I'm sorry, joules per gram times degree Celsius. And delta T is 0 minus negative 15 a.k.a. plus. 
programs that are canceled, Del Delta C cancels. So let's type this into my, f my calculator. 135 times 2.09 times 15. This is a Q1 of 4,232.25 joules. Okay, Q2, we are melting, so that means it's N delta H. So this is going to be N times delta H fusion, since we're melting. So our N, our number of moles of water, let's kind of do this over here, is equal to 135 grams of water times one mole per 18.02 grams. So we have 7.49 moles. So we have then Q2, 7.49 moles times delta H fusion in our book is we are told this is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. This is an endothermic process, so it's a positive Q. So Q2 is 45.02, and this is kilojoules. And we can go ahead and put this, we'll go ahead and change Q1 to kilojoules. So this is 4.2, was about 4.23 kilojoules. Now we have Q3. Let me move over here for room. This is a heating. This is just a regular MC delta T. So this is 135 grams. Now we have liquid water. So our C is equal to 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Delta T here, we have 100 degrees minus 0 degrees Celsius. So Q3, 135 times 4.18 times 100. You get 56,430 or 5.643 kilojoules. Q4, okay, this is boiling, whoops, sorry about that. So this is going to be N times delta H. We know our N is 7.49 moles. And in this case, we are dealing with delta H vaporization, delta H vap. And this guy is equal... To 40.67 kilojoules per mole. So type this dude into the calculator. So Q4 is equal to 304.62 kilojoules. And lastly, Q5. This is an MC delta T since we're just heating. So we have 135 grams times the specific heat. Now this is of water vapor or steam. And that is 1.84 joules per gram degree Celsius. And our delta T, we have 120 degrees Celsius minus 100 degrees Celsius. So Q5, 135 
time is 1.84 times delta T is 20 degrees Celsius. So this is 4,968 or 4.968 kilojoules. So our total Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 plus Q5. Remember, heat is a state function. So Q total, let's add everything up, 4.23 kilojoules plus 45.02 plus 4.968 plus 304.62. Oopsie. Hold on, Q3 isn't 5.643, it's 56.43. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. Q total, 4.23 plus 45 point, come on calculator, 45.02 plus 56.43 plus 304.62 plus Q5 4.968 get 415.2 say 415 kilojoules your book did a little bit more rounding and they get 416, but yeah, we're close enough. So that is the type of question I might give you something like, like that. All right, that does it, I believe, for this week. I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I will see you all soon.